so delighted to share the company of this beautiful man, Lee McCloskey. Welcome to this space. Thank you. I'm delighted to be joining you today. I have been a fan of yours and had the pleasure of sitting where you're sitting in your space and have learned from you. And when I need a new or fresh perspective or when something has become cloudy, I'll often pull up one of your many teachings online or in the books and use it as a catalyst forward. So I am delighted to share you with our community. Thank you. And I'm honored to be, uh, be, be asked by you to do this because I feel that that's our story now is finding each other, recognizing each other really for what we are contributing. I like to say like each of us holding a piece of a big treasure map that we have to bring together now. So. Oh, I love that. <laughs> well, I thought we could begin since we have some familiar people who are familiar with you, but we also have new people that let's start with where you are situated right now, the space that you are. Could you tell us about the origin of how it started and kind of what it's evolved into to create a context? You know, we're in my painted studio and it's called the Hieroglyph of the Human Soul. I didn't give it its name. It emerged to calling itself the Hieroglyph of the Human Soul, which is why I kept it quiet for a long time. It sounds a bit pretentious, but it really over time has become just that because the question became, what's the missing piece? And the missing piece turns out to be where we live, valuing and honoring what's inside of us and telling our loved ones that the story about their love is more important than our fear of our neighbor or a rebuke of a world that doesn't treat us very well. And so that's why even the, the, the story, sort of the opera here, if I think about it, because it began on 9-11-2001 when the Twin Towers came down. And it starts to tell a great symbolical story of the fall of patriarchy, meaning the false erections of money and God. These twin brothers of the Piscean period, this, I'm speaking very symbolically, of course, but it helps us understand what's behind the outer play, so to speak. And as this mythic uh, fall of the Twin Towers represents the fall of money and God, meaning this, these towers of Babel that claim, I have more than you do, be obedient. And so as this collapses, we fall back into this room because the artist really isn't about the isolated who did it. It's much more about the creative spirit finding its voice through each of us uniquely. And that's what really happened here because the story of my home is a place where we've always, I've always had discussion groups. And for the last 38 years, and we've had over 3,800 discussion groups here, so there's a lot of energy that has been gathered around the one story of, at least here, let these things matter. And so that's why it's also a library in the, the a story where I've collected all the books and realized in the act of collecting them was an honoring of our story of being human, not just what I liked, but actually a much deeper appreciation that the human story is much more interesting than my opinion of it. <laughs> and so all of these symbols uh, really came home on 9-11 and began with a very mysterious language called the watcher language, which thrust out of my hand, really, I would almost say out of my heart as an act of, of compensation for despair. Yes. Because I think all of us that were looking at these things realized that the people at the heights jumping to their deaths, all they wanted to do was hold the people they loved. They didn't really want more. They didn't want to have, I have more, darling, I'll be home soon. It was like, I wish I were holding my kids. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was the fall of these grand exalted ideas that took us away from ourselves. But after 9-11, we were left on our knees. And the question is, well, how do we tell a story that allows us to become the storyteller from a different place. And that's why this has become essentially a cave painting, meaning that it takes us back to the truth that we are the primary technology and that our relationship to the creative spirit is not what the neighbor thinks, but how do I tell my children, how do I tell my wife that it's their love that healed me? And that's what happened for me. Essentially, I feel like I fell off the scaffolding shouting at Pope and God say, and thinking these grand cosmologies matter only to find myself on my knees on that day saying, it's not about this. 
It's about this. How do I tell those I love in the time remaining mm -hmm. that we are a noble and a remarkable species, not cursed or sinful, but the true alchemists of consciousness that earn the story of being human because we don't get out of it. And that's why I love the arts. Mm -hmm. It's where we transmute our despair into the blues. We mm -hmm. turn it into a love story. Mm -hmm. We allow the romance of things to sweep our hearts because there are too many facts that just suffocate us. Oh yeah, my God. You know? <laughs> and you have two beautiful daughters and now you're a grandpa too. I'm a grandpa, yes. I have entered the realm of grandfatherhood, which is the great beard, you see. It's a, yes, I finally, see. now I, I've entered elderhood, so. Uh, <laughs> totally. One of the things you said made me think of this quote from Leonard Cohen where he says that I prayed to have some response to the things that were so clearly beautiful to me. Yeah. And that his, his poetry, his songs were this response. And that even as a child, he prayed to have a response. Yes, yes. You know, and I feel like that we're responding with these antidotes of beauty, but from a place of loving response instead of reaction to these sort of imagined hierarchical false systems that want us to be so distracted that we don't even see the beauty. Well, that's really the revelation that, that's happened here in the hieroglyph because it has been the immersion, the reassertion of the deep feminine. Mm -hmm. and, and only art can actually reveal the deeper truth because in art we have beauty. We have the expression of it in itself is the proof. You know, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is the proof of its genius. You don't have to debate whether or not it's there. You either hear it or you don't. And it really doesn't matter what you think. It transcends our thinking about it. I, that's what I love about art. It always uh, wrestles itself out of our opinion of it. Yeah. and says, I'm more interesting than what you think of me, just like any good relationship. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this, I feel, is leading um, now to a realization of, of how, how do we put this story together? How do we honor, like we were talking before this, uh, one another? So we realize what artists understand, that we're not trying to tell the same truth. We've actually come and we're on the same page. So the deep feminine here is saying, and this is what, because Quan Yin was the first uh, goddess, deep feminine mother, that emerged telling me a story uh, through this watcher language, which was this repeating quality over and over again, this repeating language of entity, a weave of living energy. And she said that, that everything is whole and holy. You are home, you are holographic. And that you will understand finally that energy is not objective, it is sentient. You are holographic, meaning that, that you are now creating qualities that allow you to realize the journey of getting here is done. And why this is intriguing for me, because we've also talked about the, the sacred and what home is sacred. Home is the one place where you can ask the questions that even if the world doesn't care about these things, I do. And that became really the motto when we moved here in 81, because I realized I was an actor in Hollywood and I didn't want to critique what that wasn't because essentially it gave me great opportunities, but I saw its limitations. And so to counterbalance that, and that's what I think is happening in people's lives. In a way, you are beholden to a type of relationship to your job, no matter what it is. And there are other agreements going on. But as the creative inner self, as this heart of ours says, I need you to understand the world's agreement is not the agreement with where you live intimately. Mm -hmm. And so much of my work has been this slow process of returning us home. Because as I said before, this turns out to be a painted cave, meaning it takes us back to the first times, to Lascaux. It takes us back to the truth that we're the technology and that we've been over the ages asking the same question, what does it mean to be human? Yes. But to know this, we had to ask it in the cave, we had to ask it in the, the first century, second century, ancient times. In other words, when you look at the library, not as which one of us was right, or boy, there were a bunch of uh, suckers or whatever, you start to say, no, the amazing thing in the library is that the human story has explored all of these things, like an electron of potentiality spinning until finally it creates a density. And that's what this library gives me because it returns me to the truth that 
we have created a story that is finally no longer about leaving. Mm -hmm. But while I am here, what do I do with the stories that I realize don't interest my neighbor nor the many, but they are so near and dear to my heart, if I don't somehow find a way to express it, I will either go mad or die of, of, of an inner sorrow. You know, and this, this is, I think, our, our time we're in now. Yes. Well, I love your focus on the home. And when I was at your home and got to sit with your cats and have tea with your wife, the, the uh, layers of your home, like I share things that I've learned from you often, but the one I keep sharing is about the levels of your home. Yes. It's interesting how striking that was to me and your decision to just inhabit this home and paint it the way that you have. Would you be willing to share with us the levels of your home? I think that could be, because part of this work with sacred artists, artists in their spaces. Right, in right. Their videos. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think this is important because artists in sacred spaces, I feel so, in, it's almost imperative at this point, that, that we have been taught, and especially women, that there's nothing of anything essential within you. That, that, that unless you find your way as something that brings money in or that you have no particular value. And I think it's broken the heart of the creative spirit, meaning that if you can't sell me, you're not interested. And that so many of us have said, and this was really my compact, is that this is for my family. This is for community. And I've been able to ask questions that I feel have been able to do what creation should be reveal a prophetic lens because I'm not using the lens like a religious lens to tell my neighbor he's wrong, nor my other neighbor that she should do things differently. I'm realizing like an artist, like Cezanne or Matisse, you or I would paint a landscape very differently, but we'd learn from each other's paintings. We wouldn't learn from critiquing how you should do it like I do it. And this is why I feel that the agreement here is as we re are returning home, and that was what I heard, the books in the library essentially tell me that, that we don't understand yet because we think, oh, they were famous, or that, but that the creative spirit in all of the books in the library have always been driven home. That we rush out into the world thinking, oh gosh, I'm so passionate about this, this will matter to others. And not only does it not matter, it makes others angry. Do you know, there's a pushback. And, and, and that's when there's a retraction that I think is, and this response to saying, I need you to think about where you feel safe to ask some questions. And that's the feminine too, right? She's saying, look, the masculine in all of us is this outward thrusting ego, meaning pushing outward, convincing others. But she's saying, like the hub of the wheel, the wheel is set, it's spinning around you. That's like my work on the tarot, like a gyroscope. So as we pull back, we pull back to the heart, which is not just my heart, it's the human heart. So it's the center that through the heart brings us together. And that's why the levels of my home became so significant because this was not an intentional, like, like if I had described the space, I never could have been this clever because it, it, it was. Now, I started, uh, as I said, in 1981, I realized because I was doing the television show Dallas and there were great accolades, but I was then counterbalancing this because I started hosting a um, theosophy, uh, ULT, theosophy discussion group in my home that lasted for 25 years, studying Blavatsky and ancient esoteric doctrine, which led to a Thursday night discussion group and looking at Western inner tradition and Jung. So I, I cover the field, but that, that the, why I'm saying this is, this is what is the sort of basic crucible, you know, this sense of, of people keep coming here every Tuesday night and for many years as well, Thursday night, with the intention of let's inspire each other. More like an acting troupe saying, I trust your instrument, so I'm not going to critique it. I want to see where we go together, like scene work. We're, you know, in a way, the greater idea isn't one of us, but the shared enthusiasm. So this became the, in a way, the, the mentoring energy that as I, because I asked many years ago, I thought people would ask me, and they, they didn't mean it snidely. I, you know, I took it snidely at times, but they go, well, why are you interested in these arcane things, Lee? I mean, they have no real relevance in the world. What's the point? Do you know, I mean, why, you know, how, and, and a lot of people couldn't understand it. And, and for me, it was vital 
So I realized I started attracting people who that was also vital to as well. Do you know, because most of the world just never found it all that interesting. But it allowed me to inadvertently cultivate in my own home the story I needed to know, yeah. which is how do we find our way home? How do we hold what turns out in my home to reveal, because there are three levels, the below, the middle, and the above. In this story, it's the below is structure, like the piano. The in-between is domestic responsibility, the heart, the womb, the chest. I love, because I love then, as we ascend to the upper level into the library here, we are moving into the imagination, into the multidimensional stories that, if we are not anchored, sweep us away. Mm -hmm. But one of the great signatures here, because we, we've spent a lot of time in discussion group reading Jung, the Red Book, a lot of things that really go deep into opening up the unconscious and, and, and honoring it not as something to be shouted to the world, but really cared for by the custodians that say, you know, I really do think that honoring these things gives them a place to exist. And I think that that's why on 9-11, as the towers came down and this language erupted through me, downstairs I had uh, created uh, my tarot revisioned, which are 22 original pen and ink drawings, not based on other drawings, but uh, entirely from going very deeply into the, the tradition, but also then like an archaeologist, because this is what artists can do, using the very tool of creation to explore the nature of creation. It's a bit like reading Hamlet and playing Hamlet, are two very different things. And, I, and this is why, as an actor, I think this was a great tool for me. My questions were all it was about embodiment. So I spent 17 years not simply reflecting on the archetypes, but quite literally moving into their realms and those qualities mediating like a dance, like music through the instrument, through my hand into a fixed form. And this is why I feel it's such a powerful tool and why it's a very interesting revelation in itself because I could never create a magician, a trickster. It was a magus, a seed bearer, meaning that it is not smoke and mirrors and optical illusions by which we know who we are. It is by planting seeds of the questions of life and meaning that do not grow all at once any more than a painting is painted like that. Right. And so it's experienced. Yeah. So like experiencing the information and creativity as you're creating, you're experiencing and embodying it. It's not a head thing or a concept yeah. thing. It's actually happening in real time, as you said, coming through your hand. And then I feel like the other thing that happens is we, we see the information as it's arising, which cognitively goes back through the eye system, through the brain, through the body, through the heart and back out the hand. So the circuitry gets developed and created over time, which allows you to have greater access to information while you're in the act of creating. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's why I realized that even my, my introduction to being an artist, my dad was an artist, he was, he was a painter. So I was an actor and I, I was always, uh, in a way, intimidated when your dad's a very good painter, you think, ah. Um, but, but he gave me the gift of, of not trying to paint like him. It was, yeah. it was quite sage. And he, when I was at Juilliard studying acting, he said, I was really always journaling. I was always drawing. I was fascinated because he would always say, when you can't talk about something, paint it, draw it, meaning use your creative tools to move beyond where you feel limited with, I can't go any further. Well, then see where it takes you. And he gave me great advice because he, he, he felt overtrained. So he said, well, go to the museum and, and look, start being an observer. Allow yourself to be mentored not by words, but by observation. Yeah. So, so they really became my great mentor. But my whole relationship to painting, because I didn't set out to be a painter, was that, that I was using, I, I was really trying to find a very violent character that I was playing in a, in a play in my first year at Juilliard. And I couldn't find it. Uh, and it was a character that wanted to kill his father, and I just couldn't find that that rage. And I wasn't. I, I was. And and so I I saw a a uh, calligrapher, a Japanese calligrapher, talking about breath, and about the connection to emotion and the allowing of the the pigment to capture the breath. 
And I thought, how beautiful, because, and how much like an actor, because you're trying to find means to stabilize the emotional nature, meaning how do I find the emotional truth, truth of this? And if we liken that to then the hand involved, right? How do I find the emotional truth of this? We start to see this, this, this synesthesia. And that's what I started to discover because I started throwing paint at the canvas, you know, because I'm trying to find the physicality. Right. So I'm, I'm really using my body. I'm throwing it out because I feel very, almost like I'm, I'm really covered in plastic. Like I just can't really connect with anything. And, and, it was, and, I, and I thought, well, how do I break through this? And I thought, I'll use paint, breath, gesture. It ended up looking like a very thick Jackson Pollock by the time I was done, but it set me free because yeah. I was not going to be an optical artist. None of my questions were going to lead me on the path of what do I think this looks like, right. but much more how does this feel? And yeah. that from that feeling nature, the optics emerge. It's not the other way around. And this is, do you see, and, that, and this is what I think, because we were talking beforehand, and I think this is the key that uh, indigenous cultures understand, alchemy understands, which is that all qualities and conditions are grown based upon a relationship, not upon an illustration, that's reflection. And that means you're simply going to see what you already think. Right. But a co-participation is where suddenly we are discovering because we are willing to have that not knowingness. And that's why I tell people, we must move away from art as a product into understanding art and being an artist is an approach. It's the willingness to understand that I must step into the question. I'll be mentored by the difficulty. And if it's too easy, like if I carve in soap, great. But the first time I climb into the bath with that sculpture of mine, it's going to melt. And I feel like that's the key is, well, what do you want to sculpt in? And this is why I feel the, the, the creative doesn't let us off the hook. There's always this deeper ideal. You must keep going. And that's what all of my painting is. In a sense, it's one question leading to the next. The below creates the wheel of the tarot because tarot means wheel. It, it shows us that this room that I, I actually designed the room for my father when he was very old, he was going to live here. Um, and so it's the father's room. I mean, even the symbolism is great. The yeah. father's room that the son designs. Yes. And the son says to the father, dad, what's the difference of things? And dad lives in Kansas, meaning it's always black and white. So he's going to say, listen, kid, don't leave the house until you understand the empress and the devil are not the same thing. And they don't have the same agenda. When you're about 17, I'll let you go. You'll contest the instrument, go out into the world. And that's how long it took me to create tarot revision, 17 years. And I thought, I'm, I'm not going to overlook the symbolism here as well, is that the cultivation of a deeper perception isn't done immediately. It's not because we change our mind. It's because we cultivate something that we're not expecting. Like I have to say, I didn't have some great sense that I would ever create a tarot. It, it all happened essentially by chance. And I think that that's very important because many of the things that become the most essential in our lives show up in a way very tangentially. They don't show up in our face. They sort of seduce us, yeah. <laughs> slowly beckon us in. And that's why even the metaphor of my home was what I am so delighted to actually be able to have found because I always thought I'd studied so much myth and Joseph Campbell and and the question is, well, well, how do you integrate these things? You know, what's the point? How do you integrate archetype? Why do you? And I love that all of this comes home like the library saying, it's not about something else now. It's understanding the three levels. You have the black and white below, which is the knowledge of the father, the archetypes or the structure. Joseph Campbell would say, this is the myth that regardless of the culture is always telling it over and over again. And when we think about that, then the human story is always the struggle of how do I love? How do I honor love in a world that tells me to do the opposite or when I love strikes me down? Do you see? And it is like Job in the Bible. It's that sense of will you love me in spite? And I feel like that's what is so powerful about the hieroglyph of the human soul is that it's this outcry from at least where I live, yes, I love the human story. 
I love this gift of being human. I love the opportunity to transmute the despair into something beautiful. And when I look at the inheritance of those that, let's say, built the rose windows in Notre Dame, we must understand it's a time of war and plague and difficulty. And everyone is thinking the world is evil. And yet, in spite of that. So when we see timelessness in the library, when we see our greater beauty, it's always the artists and, I, and in any discipline that remind us that you are not the difficulty. You are the remarkable being that is capable of transmuting the difficulty into something beautiful. And the last key for us now is, I want you to return home. I want your agreement with the creative spirit to be as sacred as the uh, daughter and son, the husband or wife you love. You see, this is true. That is just so beautiful. And I, you know, as I've shared with you, just feels so uncommon to just bring it so to home and to union when so much spiritual content is about the, you know, transcending this humanness or ascending beyond this. It's like this getting beyond this. And I keep feeling like, no, we got to get in here and how do you get in here? And by claiming home and by claiming the relationship with your beloveds and your children and your physical space as your place, at least here is I'm going to live in this paradise, which I know is real now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's a huge call that is so missing for us to begin to, it, it, it changes the entire context in which a being is, is having a human experience. And so when you say the hieroglyph of the human soul, what do you really mean by hieroglyph? Can you tell me about that? Yes. If we think simply the picture book of the human soul, Meaning, you know enough, let me draw you a picture. And this is the great thing, like music, oftentimes a picture resolves a million things that no amount of words can. But a picture also, and this is important as well, like music frees us from a definite interpretation. It doesn't judge us. Like this room has no judgment any more than a library judges us. It tries to restore us to the truth that I want to create a place where you feel safe where you can explore with curiosity and a sense of wonder the things that matter most to your heart. But this room, because it's my home, and we ascend up, this is the top floor, which is very interesting, because as above, so below. It is literally the above studio to the below studio. So the below has the black and white wheel of the tarot. The tarot, if we think about it simply like 22 slices of the pie, 22 spokes of a wheel, hold the characters of the human psyche, meaning that from the devil to the empress to the emperor, all of these qualities like a piano are what construct who and what we think of ourselves as being. In a sense, we're each given the piano. But the question of once the laws, once the black and white is known, and this is the Wizard of Oz element in this house as well, is because we ascend from the black and white, not unlike Dorothy in Kansas in black and white, moves to the colorful Oz. She moves from the difficult world of of nasty people and and difficult circumstances to the world of the imagination. But the first thing we have to remember is she wants to go home. You don't want to stay there. And I'm convinced this is a deep parable for our times because the house or the home here is telling us the same thing. In other words, we want to ascend into our imagination, but we don't want to be trapped there. We want to return to the black and white to understand in the black and white, oh, my relationship with the black and white world is like a musician to a piano. I can either start, continue to condemn the keys of the piano and the characters in the play, or I can begin to say, at least where I live, let me put this together in a way I can live with. And that to me is what the artist's responsibility is. The storyteller's responsibility is. Don't in a way, inflame things with your grand conceits. Be humble. And that's why for me, I even think the symbolism of my falling on my knees on 9-11 is the truth. We're on our knees. We don't know anything. And we are following AI, artificial intelligence. And my story is no, we follow AI, ancestral intelligence. Because if we follow AI, and this is what transhumanism is a nonsensical notion. Until we become human, we cannot transcend it. And when you become human, you no longer want to transcend being human any more than you want to give up the hugs of the people you love. 
and tell me you wouldn't want to stay a moment longer just to hug them just a little bit tighter. There's no guarantee of anything except that love. And when we see that clarity, then we stand proudly in the human story and say, at least here, I honor my relatives, my forebearers, who I realize encountered as they still encounter around the world, despair beyond imagining. And yet they continue. And yet they pick up. And when I was in the killing fields in Cambodia, I was overwhelmed with soul trauma, thinking, what do you do with this evil? And the heart of darkness said, you do not look at the evil. You look toward the living, toward the smiles of our people. It is in their life that you realize that the human story is always not in fighting this darkness, but in spite of this darkness, saying, I still choose to love. Mm -hmm. And I feel this from every artist that surrounds me in the library. Mm -hmm. As if Van Gogh said, you think I'm mad. I just love more greatly than you could possibly bear. Amen to that. Well, when I come, I'm going to have to bring a book so you can paint the edge and put it in the library. When I'm good, good. <laughs> I want to be in there too. Oh, you have to be. Oh, that will be, uh, that will be truly good. And, that's, and, and that reminds me because my dad, when he died, and, and this is very important for all of us because it was a very extraordinary experience, but I saw his book of life being squeezed and the waters returning to the waters of life. And his book was placed on the shelf in the library. And it, it, it said with such deep reverence, ah, but now it's been lived. Mm. And then I came back almost like, from, like Scrooge after the third night going, we got it all wrong. Mm. There's great reverence for your willingness to not know. Yes. You have to discover the universe in your own terms to make sense of why it really only makes sense when I love. And even that seems fleeting. Right. And even more impossible as days go by. Do you know, I think that this is, this is the churning alchemy of a birthing renaissance. Yes, I love that. You're making me think of um, some of the myths, like I'm thinking of like the Selkie myth or Fox woman mm -hmm. and how these myths have been existing in our culture, you know, really informing us. And in my family of women, we were, we were taught like, hold on to your skin, you know, don't ever let, any masculine or feminine hide your skin from you in the case of the selkie where the fisherman hides the skin mm. or the fox woman where the hunter tires of the wildness of the fox woman and eventually the selkie will find her skin and will leave and the fox woman will tire of that not being able to be herself and she'll leave and so i keep looking at these myths and just really being ready for the fox woman and the hunter to have a real dialogue about what it means to be a wild woman and domesticity and can, what is the agreement that we can make? So I actually um, created a new ending to Fox woman where she makes an agreement with him that she's going to live, you know, half her life out in the woods being a Fox. And when she was called or when the moon mm -hmm. is full, right, she'll return and she'll have some level of domesticity as she chooses, but that he doesn't have to lose that wild feminine and she doesn't have to lose the wild feminine. And then together they can make new agreements. So I started rewriting, you know, I don't know if that's sacrilegious to the myth no. world, but I got really tired of the home being abandoned by the wild feminine and the male who's doing his work and wanted to kind of capture her so she wouldn't leave because he's afraid of mm. that wildness. Meanwhile, that's why he fell in love with her. Right. Trying to now domesticate her to keep her contained because of his fear of losing her. And then he loses her. And I'm thinking these stories just go on and on of these myths of the masculine and feminine coming together and then dividing, di dividing. And then the home is either left with one or the other. And so I'm in a place my own way with, with you where I'm saying, how does, how does this story change where we actually choose home together and wake up enough to say, I want to be here with you and we need some new agreements because actually we're both wild souls and you need your wildness time too. Mm -hmm. Some way to change what the home is. And when you come home with the boon from your hero or hero's journey and they don't recognize you or Jesus is not known in his own town, mm -hmm. there's, there's some stories we need to change about how that's going. And I feel like we're at a precipice where we could actually do that. I feel like you're doing that in your own home and with your family. 
Well, you know, and, and I, I appreciate what you're saying. And it reminds me, Joseph Campbell, I always remember, and I quote him often, said that the artists of every generation must reinvigorate the myths. And when you talk about the myths that are important to you and that you've reinvigorated, this is how myth is alive. It's not there's one answer. This is what was, it has been lost, even in early Christianity, or these early periods. It's this exuberant exploration of the idea, not the codification and restriction, but actually, oh my gosh, you're inspired. Like jazz musicians, let's see where this takes us. Let's riff and let's trust that riffing. Yes. And, and, and then there's, of course, there's the, that always follows, it's, it's historical, you can see the wave where the living idea becomes calcified or becomes codified, turns into institution, and institution then represses anything of the living spirit, because that's very difficult, politically speaking, women are deprived of a soul, men are told to be obedient, we, we know the story. <laughs> But if we understand that not as a rejection of our own myth, but saying, well, why did we go through these things? One of the things that is astounding to me, because I didn't, as you said, it's like revisioning Genesis. Is that okay? <laughs> there is that feeling of, you know, and, and that's exactly what happened when I started painting who, uh, the, the Eve on the pillar in the center of the hieroglyph, because she started telling me a story called Adam, Re, uh, Adam Reborn and Eve Restored, a romance in two parts. And it revisions, it, but it's like this art. It doesn't reject. Right. It simply is what I feel with the tarot. It's almost like I'm the guy who says, um, you know, I think we stopped digging too soon. There's another floor under this, that the story of Adam and Eve is a far more loving, a far richer story of a type of remarkable daring on the part of the atomization of Adam, meaning the mind of the universal imagination losing itself in all of its worlds. And in this story, and this is why the feminine, I think, is so powerful here, because in this story, Sophia, the great mother, reappears. Eve becomes she who is sacrificed in Adam's worlds because he, in this, this fear that, that emerges at the time of this sundering or this breaking of unity into an atomic, all the different worlds, creates a, a darkness that finally de severs him from his beloved. And that's why what you're getting at, and this is why I feel with Carla and I, and, our, and our, you know, um, uh, in our family, Carla and me, <laughs> and our family, is that, that um, we have always held that as our nucleus. And so everything's been in the service of our love. And this is one of the great stories also on the floor. I call it the meta floor here. The great meta floor here is linoleum. It's the linoleum floor and, and, and a, a ranch style house. And nothing says ordinary and domestic more than a ranch style house and linoleum floors. And it started, and if you think about that as our mythic uh, dilemma, like, oh, I'm just linoleum. I, I'm not golden. I've been taught you're supposed to be golden. These are the conceits of the, uh, I call it the three S's, the spiritual superiority syndrome. Do you know, oh, no, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be on that planet. It's like when you're in the library, like when you're at the center of the wheel, you begin to understand, no, you are the hub around which the wheeled universe turns. You are holographic. And if you think more like theater than religion, which teaches it's, it's elsewhere and it's not you, but theater says, no, it's you. We need you in the third act. So your transcendence is not about leaving us, but actually about bringing to the story itself your own journey and difficulty of your human story that you have done something with and said, at least here, this is my relationship with the creative spirit. And more and more, there's this emphasis with my work and everything that's emerging in this prophetic lens here, which is if you have to shout, don't whisper. The people who are meant to hear you will to start thinking from the magnetic rather than the, the impressive to stop worrying about what the neighbor thinks and start looking at those you love and to really begin to realize we are the technology and we're being asked to finally say, at the end of this journey, you're being asked to trust intimacy and that you will not be able to find your roots until you understand that what the mother says here, I am the knowledge of your atoms, 
There are no evil atoms. If you don't like your stories, tell better stories. I love all of my children. They are all whole and holy to me. And whether dark or light, they are part and parcel of the weave of my tapestry of life. It is not for you to judge that tapestry, but to create from that tapestry stories of beauty. Do you see stories of meaning? Stories that you can share. And this is why we used to think of seven generations, because we didn't think of ourselves as escaping our humanity, but that we were responsible through generation for humanity. And that's the thing of why everything here, my house is at the edge of the sea, meaning that we've come across the country, there's no further to go. On 9-11-2001, I heard inwardly that the last flood was water, this one's information, mm -hmm. and that I was to build an ark. Yeah. And that not an ark for the physical seas, but for the mental waters. And that one of the great truths is that we have to learn how to navigate our story. And that's why when people come to our home, Olandar, they're welcomed into safe space. They're welcomed into family space. And they're given permission to not have to impress, but to finally take a breath and say, let's honor the fact that we're showing up. We all feel personally that nobody cares about these things. And I always say to people when they're here, I want you to look at each other and say, no, you showed up. You do care. They care. They care. And if we honor that, then like the Renaissance, the rebirth, it wasn't the many. It was those that said, if we hold this to be relevant for us, it doesn't matter the numbers because we will cultivate that as custodians that say, I can't grow an orchid in the wind, but I'll grow an orchid and I'll find those that want to join me in my greenhouse. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Well, gosh, it's, there's everything you say. I feel like it opens to another window. I'm like, oh my gosh, which questions do I get to ask? I want to ask about something that I heard in one of your talks about um carla being like a place of grounding like that she who saved what did you say she who saved my soul or yeah yeah healed my soul healed she who healed my soul yeah. now when you were in the other life and dallas and acting and all of that you were obviously still me but was there a moment where you kind of went whoa i have some access to some different information that than other people are seeing in a way that she helped you keep that sane somehow well you know i did not share my my drawings i when when carla and i met um i i kept up my portfolio because it was always personal when i because i started it at juliet i would just draw and my work was very dark i mean it's very gothic you know very <laughs> young 20s you're not happy um a lot of and, and i had had um also just a little background i i had from about age of 14 to my early 20s, I had nightmares every night. I had out-of-body experiences. I had par sleep paralysis. So I had been so thrust into my unconscious that, you know, the, the sentence would be, I knew I wasn't crazy, but if I didn't get a, a handle on a way to find a way to language these things, if I talked about them, it would sound right. bonkers. Right. And, and so, so what I did, and especially from Juilliard on, I, I would keep my drawings hidden and my writings as well, which were also pretty much a, a, an exploration of, of the dark side of the psyche, meaning that which is in a tumultuous inner turmoil. I was not happy. I, I had essentially voices in my head even, you know, that feeling of like being overwrought. Well, you can see I had a lot on my mind <laughs> and it was having a, a field day with me because in a way I was being submerged into a place where I had to find the tools, you know, to build them. And what was amazing was Carla was, she loved it. You know, she sort of loved this gothic side, you know, this like, like this dark drawings. And I, and I thought, really? Wow. You know, it's like, because I think that's the most vulnerable. You'd think somebody would go, oh, you're weird. You know, like, oh, what are you writing about? And she was really intrigued. You know, she really was. And so we would, so with that sort of breath of fresh air, you become a little bit more like, oh, you're, because as we all know, if somebody goes, oh, I'm not interested, you go, I'm not going to share that again. Or if somebody shuts you down, you think, well, maybe I won't bring that up, you know. And, and, and so it was really beautiful because what she gave me and gives me, is, because is this, this remarkable field of energy yeah. 
that when we connect, our, our, our atoms love each other. They stabilize each other. It's very alchemical. It's even it's physical. I mean, we could always feel this uh, sense with each other. And photographers also, also used to say when, when we'd take pictures together, they could see that there was a marked relaxation in my, my, my face. And, I, and that's why I started to realize, I, I always felt, and that's why it's interesting I wrote this Adam Reborn and Eve Restored, because I always felt not personally, because I was never a bastard. As many of bastards as I played on TV, I'm not one. <laughs> um, my mom taught me to be chivalrous and my dad to honor women, so I had good training. But, um, uh, you know, so much of our, our journey together was this, this growing relationship of, even in Hollywood, deciding to make our relationship the primary key, because Carla was a an assistant director and a director and a, a production manager. So she had, she was behind the camera and always in charge of, of everything. So she had that, that other, you know, side. And she was actually very important in the director's guild because she was the one that began uh, job sharing for mothers so they could have a family, they could nurse their children, you know, they could, and that was really her. So she's a very powerful individual. She's really done a lot in her own right. And, and I feel that she embodies the heroic feminine. I've always adored her strength. I, I, I called her, especially because we, the fire came to our front door and we stayed and defended our home. And I thought nothing to find Carla Moore when the cops said, you got to leave. And she said, if my husband's not leaving, I'm not leaving. And she stayed with me. And I said, you know, I married a Viking queen. She's not great in the kitchen, but she's tremendous in battle. <laughs> and, and I feel like that's why I, I feel this great honor of the power of the feminine. I grew up with great examples of, uh, with my own mother as a teacher, as, a, as an embodied, compassionate uh, woman who had gone through things, but, but was never coming from a place of victimization, right. but empowerment. So I, I feel like that's what is sort of behind, as I said, that in me, before I met Carla, there was, uh, and I think it was part of this darkness, this churning in me, this unforgivableness. And I, and I almost think it's inheriting the sins of the father, meaning that, and I liken this to now when I tell people the story here at Olandar and in the hieroglyph, the human soul, I say, we have to take a minute to honor this is sacred Shumash land. Yes. The indigenous people that lived here for 10,000 years, they never had a word for war. They saw themselves as custodians of the earth that no one had the right to own it because you don't live long enough to own anything. Yes. You must make it worthy of not only yourself, but all the kingdoms that you share their food and they share their food with you. It was a very different etiquette. And so there's this feeling, I'm the white guy on the land. Yep. So how did I get here? Yep. Well, I, I symbolize essentially the devouring ego, the sense of whatever you have, I take. This is the masculine, meaning until I reach where I can go no further. And that creates an unforgivableness in a way because of the imbalance in the inner self. And this is why I do, I feel it's a big key that the feminine must forgive because that's where he can find his soul again because he cannot forgive himself. And this is what I found with Carla, you know, that there was, and then my daughters were born and there was this greater and greater sense of it's okay. Put the books on the shelf. In a sense, the wars are done. You don't have to keep battling that way. Look away from the chaos and look toward me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what the feminine is trying to do, the mother's trying to do, the sense that I want you to come back to me with honor, not with fear. You will, your fears will go away because we'll hug each other. And that, I, I really do feel that it's, it's that, that I even asked, I said, why do I know so much about the, the deep feminine? Because I would never deign to say, I don't understand women. I don't any more than I'd say I understand men as a generality. It's, we're right. also very unique. But I, did, I heard from this, only he who loves me absolutely may know me completely. And I feel that's what's been forgotten, that the heart of the beloved is the truth that each of us are whole and holy. So you are Eve, I am Adam. And any relationship we have is the recreation of the whole story in particular art, particular form, particular pigments. But we are the universal being in those pigments. Mm -hmm. And if we find that universality and we find it in one another, then I really believe we give it a place to dwell. And I think the deeper love that's been expressed here 
by our family, our friends, by the community that shows up here, saved us during the fire. I felt a prayer field around us. We it was were, palpable. We were, it, we were tracking you. We oh, were just, it was. It was I astounding. So intensely, like, as soon as I tuned into it, I felt everybody else and we were, it was a strong field. I mean, we were with you. We yeah. were tracking, we were paying attention, reading your children's posts. We were just like, and when you, and I, I remember turning to my husband, Jonathan and being like, we and Carla are staying in the house, you know, like <laughs> this sense of like, this yeah. is our place and we're not going to go. Yeah. And what happened all around that. And now you're all in that recovery phase and just, Wow. And that, and that I really, and everyone, yourself included, I want to honor that because it is so much of these things, because we're in an optical world, we see the violence and it's very reactive. We see it quickly. We don't understand the deeper nature of love with a capital L. And on the night of the fire, it was truly a baptism of fire because as the fire tornado hit me and punched me back into my house and this process of moving back out into the fire, into the, the relationship to everything. We lost 170 neighbors, so everything had burned around us. But at 2 a.m., when I felt the, this prayer field, and it said, you feel everyone's prayers for you and Carla and Olandar, and I did, and I saw a dome, like breath being pushed out, and it was that realization that we don't see these things until there's a threshold experience where yeah. everything falls away. Yeah. I mean, the trees were saying, we're not fuel, we're guardians. Yes. And everything around me, my garden was talking to me saying, everything in the garden is alive. Yes. Everything alive wants to live. You're the part of the garden in motion. Yes. We have your back. Yes. And it made me feel, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. We've always thought we're battling nature, mm -hmm. then working with nature, mm -hmm. because nature wants the better outcome as well. Do you see, so, so much of this for us yeah. is the truth that the fire is at our door. And the transmutive force here is that, and this is what the library tells me, the fire that brought us here, like the guy on the Indian land, all of that now is that as we do, as we do in Cambodia on the killing field, not to look with shame and hate and regret, but to honor that through all of this difficulty, we will finally stand as trees erect in the holy ground that honors the blood that has fallen, that realizes that to earn the story of being human has been tormenting. It has been beyond impossible, and yet we have endured. And I think nothing says heroic to me more than that. Mm -hmm. And when we understand that, when we stand as the heroic outcome of a story, mm -hmm. it's like turning to your beloved and feeling heroic. Suddenly she sees in you, or he sees in you, a sense of, wow, mm -hmm. I never saw it the world light up as you. Mm. And each of us are moving toward there. So it's not something noisy now. It's not something to convince the neighbor. It's to honor the creative spirit like you would any loving relationship. This matters between you and me. And if it matters to others, fine. And I always say to artists now, don't ask others what they think about your work. Ask them what your work makes them think. Love Move that. beyond the critique Mm -hmm. to the conversation. Yeah. No artist needs critique. We do that for ourselves. Right. What we need is to nurture each other and to use a lot of, I think, theater keys, meaning that we're an ensemble group. We have different instruments. And let's riff. And let's understand, like she was, you know, uh, uh, Shiloh was showing me the, the painting before, her painting that she's working on. And I see it as a language. I see this as a language. And I feel that that's what we're doing is that, and this is what the Renaissance was. I always remind people, listen, El Greco, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci are on the earth at the same time. Right. It's not like the Messiah. It's not in that tradition. It's as if the idea is saying, I'm going to enflesh all of these stories. And I feel like, Shiloh, what you're doing is what many of us are doing is we're creating nodes. We're creating community. Yes. We're drawing to us not the large numbers, but the intimate uh, storytellers that are saying, you know what, I like this. I feel better when I think like this. And maybe other people will roll their eyes and think I'm crazy. Well, maybe I won't talk. I'll just say, hi, how are you doing to those people? Not dishonor them. Yeah. But I'll turn to the ones that are showing up saying, 
we're on the same page. So let's honor that. And, and I really feel that it's a two-way street, that we're going from the Piscean period, which the Hopi call the period of separation. And I see this as the journey of the development of the ego. And in the room here, we reach the mirror here, meaning we end the sense of self-reflection. And where am I getting to? Who am I? And we finally turn back to realize we're the outcome of a great story. And it teaches us, because it's the library, that we have infinite resource, but we must trust our curiosity, because otherwise everything remains latent. We must ask the question, and here the question is asking all of us, for these questions, I want you to feel safe, and I don't want you to use your insights as a proof of anything. You would not use your love for your husband or wife as a proof of anything. It's too meaningful for that. And I think this is where the creative spirit wants us. A bit on our knees, enough of it. My joke here is that, that no matter how grand your cosmology, when your work is at home, your wife looks at you blankly and says, take out the garbage. And I feel that's the truth, is we've got to take out the garbage. Get off the scaffolding. Stop thinking our ideas are so high and mighty and important. They're important because they bring back to us the richness of things. Mm. But if it's so we can sell it or brand it or convince others that I think this is where we make the mistake. Mm -hmm. And we're being retrained to say, mm -hmm. let's create new boundaries, new agreements, and not worry about what's not happening, because let's honor the fact that we are happening. We're slowly, by honoring, creating seeds. And that's what I use this work as a proof of now. Yes. You know, the bona fides is the hieroglyph of the human soul. Yes. And it is such an environment when you're in there, it's like the place that you've imagined exists, exists. And I think at some level, I feel this, many of us feel this sort of aching for the concept of the Library of Alexandria. Yes. Right, and even though most of that information was still very masculine, we have Hypatia there as the last librarian, but we, there's this idea of like the place of the world's wisdom that was then taken through ignorance and burned, right? And I feel like that library exists within each one of us in some way, but we're responsible to and accountable to discover the parts of the library that are ours, that the, the book that we will put on the shelf. Yeah. And that's one of the things I say to my students is like, if you were a book on the shelf of the cosmic library, what would that be? And if someone were to find your painting in 300 years, what would they say you were? Mm -hmm. The way that we look at archeology span now of like, okay, these people are yeah, born. Good. These people honored the goddess. These people obviously were, you know, we, we deduce from the art who right. are ancient people. Where art is the, the only real history. The writing is, you know, subjective because they've moved it around so much with the art. And so I say, okay, what, what would they say about who you were? And if you were going to mm -hmm. make one major book or one major painting that was that represented who you were as a people in your own family. What are the things that would be included in that? Like my husband okay. and I have cafe every single day together, at least an hour, which is big when you're busy and running all those businesses and driving yeah. everywhere. we have cafe and it's like, he stirs the coffee and he puts the honey and he puts extra love in. And he will say, when I hear the, the spoon on the cup, he'll say, you know what that means. And so then we gather with the cats and we have cafe <laughs> yeah. all over the world. You know, wherever we are, we have cafe, we stop. And yeah. I'm talking like almost every single day for a minimum of an hour. And in that hour, everything that we end up doing that matters is arises from there, from that time of union. Everything yeah. we create, everything we learn from those dialogues that we have. And so my painting would have a teapot in it, right? Mm -hmm. so what would the painting be that represented who you were in your family, in your life? And that's part of what we do in Intentional Creativity is to not just represent what is seen, but actually what is lived within and bring it as an external image so that it can be viewed and lived with and then allowing yourself to be changed while you're in the creation process, which is what happens for me where like the other day I, I was thinking about how I don't like subconsciousness as an indication that it's below consciousness. I sort of think of subconscious as something that exists between supra and conscious and then unconscious definitely is 
in the below and the and the unknown. But subconscious, so I started thinking it's really like inner consciousness. It's really mm-hmm. inter. There's symbols and shapes and dreams and stories, and I really have conscious access to it as an artist when I choose. So mm-hmm. I started painting this painting. I said, well, what does interconsciousness look like in a painting? So I just started going and going and going, and I got this huge, huge cave, and then I got this these three trees, and then this little tiny couple emerged, and they're just leaning their heads into the dark cave. Mm-hmm. Just let the whole thing come out. And I was like, wow. I mean, the center of this is like six feet. The center of this was this couple like leaning into the starry dark cave. And I was like, okay, so this, this is my illustration of interconsciousness. And it ended up being union. And I definitely thought of you because it was, it was a surprise that that's what ended up happening. You know, it, actually threading that, that together, it's very interesting. The relationship going back to the library of Alexandria and the burning of the library. Because on the night of the fire and the prayer field, there was this Library of Alexandria feeling. It will not burn again. That the warehouse, the storehouse of human striving will not be lost. And why this becomes intriguing about when you talk about the couple, you know, this sense of like, finally, when it comes back to husband and wife or lover and beloved, the the sense of when it becomes that intimate we get this really this arc of a story that says now you can tell a story from this perspective not from it's about something else but together we can peer into this deep dark cave in a sense we are each other's support we're great partners we we allow ourselves to really watch each other's back and i feel like that's what what a lot of this is about is that a lot of the problem has been about duplicity, meaning about not seeing somebody else's back or cutting them down, not taking time to actually develop the type of relationship that creates trust where you can go anywhere together. And that's the great alchemy I found with Carla and I is, is there's this real gnosis that we can go anywhere together. We are a extraordinary partnership. And, and this comes from mutual respect. I think this is the honoring of the deep feminine in both the masculine and feminine body because it's saying, I honor this capacity to love so greatly and be such a fierce lioness. Mm-hmm. You know, it allows me to be a lion. It allows us to be dance partners. It allows us to essentially not be taking away from one another, uh, but actually uh, allow it. And I feel like this is like when acting, when you're doing scene work, when you're doing scene work with a partner, suddenly because you're, you're not trying to correct the other character, there's this energy that starts to build and this excitement and it allows for a performance that isn't one of you, but really the combined energy. And that's why I, I kept thinking about the, the Library of Alexandria and this, this relationship to why this couldn't burn. And what I was told is that we don't realize it yet because it's, it's very intriguing. 10 years into the, the work up here, I said to myself, well, what's the acronym for the hieroglyph of the human soul? And it turns out it's T-H-O-T-H-S, which is thoughts or taught the Egyptian Thoth Hermes, which is where we have the alchemical tradition and the great expression as above, so below, which was from his emerald tablet. This takes us back to ancient Egyptian times. Now, why this is so intriguing if this is Thoth's library and the studio below is as to the studio above, the relationship of the archetypes or the keys, the structure to the imagination above, but this library is connected by the middle plane, as I say, the story, I love, therefore I am. So when I love, I do not want to leave. I do not want to ascend into my imagination to get away. I want to emerge into this greater multidimensional relationship to be inspired. So when I go back downstairs into the black and white or into domestic responsibility, I realize life asks me to ask questions from three different rooms. One is structured, black and white. How do I pay my bills and how do we navigate Kansas, Dorothy? (laughs) Then the middle, which is the domestic responsibility, family space. I love these people. They keep my feet on the ground and my head on my shoulders because when I ascend the energy of the imagination, boy, I'd love to keep my sails out and stay up there. But I realize that it's trying to say, no, they're not really higher or lower. 
thought journey through us. And if you think about this civilization going from ancient Egyptian and the upright pyramids, the upright obelisks, we knock the obelisk over, Moses goes out into the desert and gets lost, the human ego starts to feel distanced from the upright, the connection, and man goes wandering in search of his soul. Then Jesus comes along and says, you are uniquely worthy of salvation. So there's the promise of unique possibility, but we go through essentially terror <laughs> for thousands of years until we finally realize we didn't get out of any of it. Mm. We earned it. And that's why this tells me that, in this, uh, that we have slowed down the light. We have translated what was once ancient golden knowing as in the time of Egypt with big helmets and pyramids. We've slowed that down and we've turned it into the human story. Mm -hmm. So now a golden precept of Ra is far less interesting to our heart than Rumi or Hafez or Walt Whitman. And this is important for us because it's saying you've been humanizing these golden stories, not to make them more cosmic, but to realize you've been translating the cosmic into the linoleum. Mm -hmm. In other words, you've been taking the extraordinary truth of who you are, slowing it down to finally saying, if I am given what I think of as the ordinary, maybe it's a gift that I don't have to fight for the cosmic golden mythic. <laughs> I can see in my children. Do you see where I'm going with this? I can see in my children. I can see in the people I love. I can see in my relationship to a brush and a pen that this breath doesn't want to go anywhere. It wants to finally be here with me. And this is, I think, what we're doing. We're beginning to understand that when you create a work of a painting, think about it, you're breathing. So what does a painting become? A lung. And that's why if we understand that when we're involved with really giving ourselves to a painting, it begins to breathe us. It begins to say, if you give yourself to me, I'll begin to breathe with you. Mm -hmm. and like classical music or jazz, I'll take you in a different place because maybe I'm country western. Yeah. Let's, go on a, let's go together. And this is why music does the same thing. So we're starting to realize that the most important qualities free us not to tell us what to do or how to be. They literally breathe us oxygenate us and then we become more inspired and less judgmental because guess what when we are judgmental we know that whatever we judge the world with as one we do to ourselves as a 10. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you see this and, and this is why again moving from a state of consciousness of the piscean which was child adult or dominant submission meaning that it was outer authority and we were to relegate to outer authority and to find a sense of success through obedience to its laws. And then we have now entered the story where we're home, we're on our knees. It's not about the false erections of money and God. And it's not even, and this is why, because it's not political, it's, it's symbolical because I, I am apolitical. But working on the tarot, it's very intriguing because they are keys. And the 16th key is the tower and the archetypes are called trumps. So we have the Trump Tower, the Trump Tower that is Mars in the Arcanum. This is important because he is orange, and you start to realize that Mars in flames makes people angry. And that's what I learned, literally I heard on the nights of the fire, that the fire arrived at my door two years, not on 9-11, as started the room here, but on 11-9, 17 years of working up here. Yes. So two years to the day of the election, the fire comes. And on the fifth night, this was quite a warning. It was apocalyptic. It said that, that the fire is upon us, that it said, tell me what you hate and I'll burn down your house. The human heart is becoming dry and brittle, knowing what it hates and forgetting what it's loving. Therefore, I am this fire that will find this brittleness, this dryness, and I will destroy it. Wherever this, wherever hate trumps love, wherever community is lost for the righteousness of being on your side, I will take it all. And this is what happened. It took all of our homes, except for ours and a few others. And I feel like that's its message to us, which is that these are apocalyptic times, and it has to do with 
how do I turn down the anger? And that's what art is so helpful for. Because a lot of times the fury, just put it in your hands and fists and paint it, scream it, dance it, let it out, but don't blame the world with it. That's right. The physicalness, like I really talk about the physicalness, which is why I invite my students to work with a big canvas, a wall, a door, or five feet as one of their initiations because it needs to be bigger than their head and bigger than their body. You have to be able to get into it. And we sometimes will, will play on it because you can hear it and you can feel it and you can pick it up and you can move it and you can lay on it. Like we really get physical because of the embodiment yeah, yeah. that can come. Like I really, it, there's just a lot available when it's too small. Sometimes it has a different impact or when I'm working with children to give them such a huge canvas that they're just like, the realm of that's the really thing. important. Yeah, that's so good. Because that sense of being able to start, that was one of the things about this room that I found. It really taught me that so much of work is this way. I and thou, I and thou. But if we go back to the cathedral, this is what I was in Notre Dame and, and I was just meditating. And, and it started to show me how the narrative moves. It doesn't stay static because in the environment, your eye begins to travel. And if you think about that as the movement of the electron or the way we think, we don't really see this way. We, we, we see and then we move and then it's this. And that's one of the things that I feel that the sensual, the nature of the body is really primary. It's really great that you're doing that because this is something that we are so out of touch with uh, this relationship to the hand. My father would always say, well, you, you see this hand of yours, this human hand? Well, it's your hand, but it's the human hand. So this is the human hand that touched the cave walls, that created the Pieta, yeah. you know, that painted the Sistine Chapel, yes. that touched the face of Eve, yes. or touched the face of Adam. I mean, I find this is, this is quite extraordinary because it's saying you are composed of this ancientness. Yes. And if you don't take it so personally and trust it more, you'll start to create the rituals that are not for the impressing of others, but for the setting of the conversation you want to have. And I think a lot of that is, is like, well, how do I just feel with my body, this thing? How do I just feel with my, my sensual self? Because I feel so nervous i've been shut down and i think that's the key is is we have to honor the fact that in this world one must be armored so the question is creating safe space creating not judgmental space refraining from judgment from ourselves and saying like we would in an acting class all right these are going to be the parameters no judgment riffing yeah. laughter you know, starting to, and I really do feel like that's, it's almost like giving to a comedy team, right? All right, these are the, these are, and suddenly they're hysterical because you just give them a few notes. And I feel like that's what I'm getting from consciousness. I don't need you to explain it. I just need you to suggest it because then we can start playing because essentially I don't know any more than you do. Because think about it, a creative process is not illustrating something that is predetermined. I ran into this on my tarot about 15 years into it, and I thought because every drawing, in a way, was more difficult than the next because I had created a high watermark. And I thought about 15 years into it, I thought, well, why can't I, if time is relative, just move to some lens where I can see the work already, get some clue as to where at least I might go? And it came back very strong, and I, it started to really indicate to me, it said, it's because we are not in time. We are a living idea that you will draw forth in your act of discovery. And I thought, wow, that's like acting, meaning that there's not like a done character that you play. If you play, like I played Trigorin and the Seagull a few years back in, on theater. So every night you would be the same character, but very different. It would come out very differently. And I think that this is what gives us a sense of rapport of, of how we can deal with the energies, not looking for constancy. Like, I think everybody feels like sometimes you feel as a <coughs> painter or an artist, you feel, wow, that's really good. And most of the time you think, God, that sucks. And, and I find you don't get out of that. It's this, you know, maybe it's like climbing a mountain. It's to keep you from getting too, uh, you know, too self-confident. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty remarkable painting. I'm, my teacher, Sue, would, when people would say, well, you know, is it really, is painting the thing? And she's like, well, there are other arts, but painting really is the thing. 
with consciousness because yeah. you're creating the image in the moment and the image is creating you in the moment. And it's this real sense and of, you know, when I'm creating, and especially because I'm not a trained artist at all, um, that because I can't dominate, and I say this, because I can't dominate the outcome, because I can't make it look like something I see in my mind, I totally let go of that. Yeah. And then I just allow what emerges to be what there is. And I follow that. Like I'm chasing a wild horse. I'm just like, I don't know where we're going, but I'm going, I'm going. And what I find is a, vital, a central vitality that is so potent in my body that gives mm -hmm. me energy I didn't have. It, it bypasses whatever emotional state I was in. Like it becomes the biggest lived experience. And immediately I go into compassion of like, yeah. I have to share this because if this is possible for me, others can feel this. This isn't unique to me, this feeling of sudden vitality and how the whole body lights up. And that's part of it too, of like when, when trauma happens, people go numb or they lose their senses. And so part of what I'm working with too is the, the acknowledgement of all the rest of the senses that are below the neck. Mm, yeah, yeah. Being treated, so all of your sensual organs, every opening, and also hands and feet as part of the sensual package, because the Aristotle story of like the five, it's so head focused. Mm -hmm. don't pay enough attention to everything down here, nor do we really be in our body as if we're this whole sensory package. And so to do things like dance, like theater, like painting, that will animate the sleeping parts of ourselves and to do it with that intent of like here i am here i am i'm like coming into form you mentioned density earlier like i'm actually coming into density or what i call riding the equal sign into matter like here i am and to give people that experience and painting does that without there needing to be skill which is why i've devoted my life to this because you don't need to have skill in order to achieve that state of flow and even I would say bliss that is possible when you're working with a big painting intuitively. That's, that is what I keep trying to stress to people is that our first relationship is with the creative spirit. And that has nothing to do with being an artist. It has to do with using medium or pigment in a way to express this sensual relationship and the relationship to the optics. I do a chi of painting class. Uh, uh, and in that I too, I have people on their hands and knees. I say, get in touch with your animal, feel your bodily relationship to the floor, to the paper. How do you feel? Become a lioness, become that which feels her belly and her breast, a sense of like literal animal connection to this so that you're not painting anything. You're actually drawing it forth. You're using it as a magical tool to fix these qualities of what we think of as a type of uh, relationship to, to spirit or relationship to the art spirit, to the creative spirit. And painting also was never about illustration as it became in the West, about a type of photo optics. That's when we essentially lost touch with or trust in the sensual. We wanted the optical. So everything became more and more optically realized, which we had to go through, but we've reached the end of that arc. Essentially, the art world has collapsed. It is the fashion world. It's what's expensive. So it's not even a conversation that nourishes these questions, which is why I think it's time to do exactly what you're talking about, which is it's not about the talent you have as an artist. That's a cultural sense of a branding, that this is how I make my living. But I feel I'm a gardener of the creative spirit. I have a relationship with the, 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 the creative spirit. Therefore, I want to create residence for it. If it's good, like a gardener, I'll share it with you. But the last thing I want to do is to put it up on the marketplace so you can judge it and tell me what's wrong with it. I'm done with those conversations because they get us nowhere. They make artists insecure. And all they do is lay the groundwork for the accountants of the imagination that say, I'm only interested in the bottom line. I'm only interested in if you can sell this. Where's your demographics? You know what? Your work is too derivative. It doesn't look like this. It looks like that. Everyone has an opinion and it's very, very difficult for the individual to, to weather that. And a lot of this, I say, is to close the door to that, to turn off media, to understand that when you pick up a paint or a paintbrush, 
in relationship to the canvas, in relationship to painting an object. You are doing what the first ancestors did. They never used art as a way of illustrating anything. It was always an act of communion. It was saying, if I can create fixed space, and I liken this to props for actors, if I can give you a place, my imagination will always be able to be with you. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring you into form so you can join me. And this is why I even say with my tarot, when people get it, I say, don't get there all serious and read it to begin with. You can go deep as you go, but think of it more like playing with dolls. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had the emperor and emperor, like Ken and Barbie, what would they say to each other? It's that. amazing what the psyche does when you allow it to put on a mask, when you don't say, hey, you got to make a living at this, or you know what they're going to think about you. Boy, that sucks. Because that's the little kid in us that yeah. was shut down at some point. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I say it is not the inner child that we're dealing with, because that leads to petulance. It's human innocence. Mm -hmm. We are the guardians of that, mm -hmm. meaning that in a world that feels and teaches that you will be betrayed by these things, it says, no, you must be the custodian and guardian of them and begin to say, I've been asking this question in far too broad a way and putting up with people that aren't interested in this in the first place and listening to them. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to the people that are interested. And this is a mental martial art, as I call it, meaning we're going from an age of karate. I'm going to kick your ass. It's going to be me against you to Aikido. I'm going to let you kick your own ass. I'm, too, I'm exhausted. I've got to take the kids to soccer. I've got to get, you know, it's like enough. And that's the feminine. It's almost like that's what I feel. She's really practical in us. Get off your high horse. There's way too much work to be done to think your political bias means anything in this world. It's shouting at the television. It doesn't work. Do something imaginative. Be a storyteller because only story changes who we think we are. And we have to begin with the story we tell ourselves and where we tell that story from. There you go. The context that you're telling the story from, which is what's been so sort of enmeshed in these, you know, imagined hierarchical and created systems. Yes. So we're rescuing, I feel rescuing the imagination from this false paradigm into this new space. But it's like, what is that new space? And how do you hang out in there? And that's why I keep saying it's not a concept. You actually have to create that space. Yeah. Like basically, you know, setting up your studio. Like mm -hmm. I always say, you know, take over the dining room, forget the guest room. Like make it your you know, altar. You know, make, like yes, make yeah. everything this space and then start living in it in a new way and make it sacred. Like I have everybody organize their paints in, in their colors. And I say, you know, wear what you feel beautiful in. Don't just, sure. you know, like light the candle. We paint with the rose, like bringing in these rituals of beauty, which a lot of people have. I've never done before except in organized religions. And when we touch the canvas and we infuse the canvas with our love and water, we put water on our hands and we touch it. People are just like, this is like one of the most sensual things that a lot of people have experienced. And it's like, Hey, but this is so easy. Like it's so potent, but it's so natural yeah. to take us to the canvas. And so for me, you know, I had dedicated my life to the divine young. I was like, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. And I remember the feeling of like totally giving myself to really to Jesus and mother Mary, like whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Just show me if you can show me what it is. And not unlike yourself, it, it wasn't like I had a goal. I actually don't have a goal or a plan. Every step of the way, it would show up so clear in the path, do this, do this. And it ended up that it was all about art, which was weird because I wasn't talented. So I kept saying, wow, you know, I can't even do, draw that tree the way it is. How, why is art on my path? And so every step of the way, it was like art was put on the path. The children were dropped off and they said, teach my children. I'm like, I don't know how to teach painting. Just do it. Yeah. You know, all along the way, these things were put and it was clear. So my prayer to just make it clear in the moment has been realized, but it, every step of the way was art. Like I thought I was going to be running a whole ministry and sanctuary of the feminine or something. And as it turns out, it's been all about art. And so this, this idea that we're creations living within a creation created to create, and that when people begin to create, they activate that co-creatorship of environment within us has become you know, what I've done 20, with 25 years of my life is invited people into this. I can't think of anything more quick 
to get somebody conscious and in their body than painting. If you think about what you're doing is you give people permission. I learned this in theater that we call it suspension of disbelief. Meaning if you play Hamlet, you know you're not Hamlet. But when you become Hamlet, you are Hamlet, and you're not, yet you know you're not. It's the suspension of disbelief, meaning I can give myself to the role, I can give myself to the fury, and I do not worry that I'll be swept into madness. I can carry this character and that character and understand the difference. And I feel like a lot of what we're trying to do is to bring these creative tools into our perception because we've really been overlaid with spiritual and religious uh, paradigms from the Piscean Age, which all have a subtle uh, hidden clause of you must be obedient to that which is not you. You must be obedient to this new revelation, this God, this other place. And that's not very good for the theater sense. It's like promising the actor transcendence in the third act. Well, if you're in the third act and we need you, your transcendence being about leaving isn't very helpful, nor is it very wise. And because, and I use the TED uh, talks, TEDx, we don't have TAD talks, we have TED talks, meaning we have technology, education, design, no art. It's very telling. Yeah. Art is not stressed in this culture whatsoever. People think, Technology is the art, and art is not a technology, it's an instrument. Mm -hmm. And this is why we are, I believe, by nature. I would say what you're doing, what I'm doing, and what many others are doing, uh, not from a monolithic from on high, but from the intimate space, we're gathering community saying, if we honor these things, then these things are honored. And believe me, like a garden that's honored, it begins to green and grow. That attracts other gardeners because we're not looking for those that just want to eat the produce or correct what was planted or tell you how they would put it in different rows. Enough of that. Yes. Thank you very much. But we've got things to do. To me, that's the feminine as well. Enough with the books that have to be read and the things that have to be studied and you're not it. and You don't have the right discipline. I think what you're going through is actually you're living a transformative experience that is saying, no, no, no. If you had all the craft and skill, let's say you were a virtuoso and at six, you could draw like, like, like Daumier or, you know, you could draw impeccably. You, you would not essentially go through the anguish of having to discover. This is why I feel Van Gogh is such a great example of this. Van Gogh is not a good painter. Cezanne is not a good painter. They're very ham-handed. They don't, they use color clumsily. They, but you can see there's this Herculean struggle, this need to just work it out. And by the time they work it out, there's an explosion of energy because it's so deeply their language. And that's why I feel like if we think more like indigenous beings, then in the tribe, you're meant to go paint your mask in whatever way you see. And if your story is not to be refined and defined because it's the, you know, it's sort of the, the intricate, but more the, the sensual, then your art should express that. Yes. Do you know, and, and I found that, that why my art changed, why my technique became so great in a sense was because of my work on the tarot. It, because I knew that I needed to create the tools with which to express what I needed to express, a bit like when you're acting, it's very different to do a contemporary play than Shakespeare. You know, you have to take a deeper breath <laughs> when you do Shakespeare. You have to go, oh, that's a lot of words. Um, and, and a lot of uh, other emotions that you have to create a tool with which to use it. It's a bit like singing right. Wagner if you're a singer. And that's why I feel like a lot of this is that to stick with the realization that what makes us essentially better or find our own voice is by doing it. And that if we want to express something, let's say we need for a painting, you know, something really articulated, then I'd say pick up something that, that almost, and it's just like in the old days, copy it, get the sense of, well, how is this done? I used Dura that way. And, and Bruegel, I looked at prints and I realized that they would use cross hatching and positive and negative space. And it became very influential on my tarot. I then looked at the engravings of William Blake. I looked at uh, the tradition of how do you create a, in a sense, that timeless sense of, of an ancient print. And so a lot of my techniques were because I needed it in a way to, to uh, create the resource for the questions I was asking. But I don't think it's, it's, and I feel at times like I was a guy who built a Ferrari. I don't think everyone needs to build a Ferrari. I think we need the keys to say trust 
that you've created a vehicle and it's not to impress the neighbor with it. It's not to convince others with it. It's to have a relationship you need to have yeah. with what you love. You need to say, I close the door in a world of hate and say, at least here I love. And believe me, the creative spirit goes, now you're getting it. Yes. The world's always dark. Mm -hmm. So don't take the ocean as your realization. Navigate the ocean, but pull back into your arc, meaning your home, your heart, mm -hmm. what you value, and let your art and your relationship with the creative spirit be whatever it is for you. Mm -hmm. And only share it with those that nurture. If you have friends that critique, just go have lunch with them and talk about whatever they like to talk about. <laughs> you got it. Oh my gosh, Lee, I just, I love how you think and how you present the work. Looking at your paintings is such a joy and the images of the throw. And I love sharing them with people and, I, and I'll say, you know, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, this is what it looks like. This is the, this is it. This is what the quantum looks like. This is spirit and matter together. This is that that feeling but it's on earth instead of getting out of where we are so i love i love that in your teaching i feel like you have so many um very unique to you teachings that feel like a, a lexicon mm -hmm. uh, vocabulary and so i'm just wondering if are you planning at some point to bring some of those teachings into more of a codex, like a red book, or? I, you know, I, I have my, uh, for the tarot, I have tarot revisioned. I have Adam Reborn and Eber Store. My codex is uh, Codex Tor, which uh, Flying Lotus used for his Cosmogramma. So that, that is printed, but I want to, I even did on, I've got a vid videos, I, I, I'm stopping at 22, but they're called Food for Thought on YouTube because I thought, let me give two minutes to five minutes to a particular question. Like, what do we do with the despair? You know, what do you do? How do you, in a sense, allow vulnerability in a world that doesn't let you be vulnerable? How do you deal? And so these things, so that's a type of, in a way, uh, short yes. things that I wanted to just, because I don't feel people have oftentimes uh, time to listen to a lot of things, but if they have uh, like something they can mull over, because with my discussion groups and with my books, I've realized that one of the problems is that we're taught to have an opinion, to react, rather than to have a discussion and to, to explore. And so much of my work is to really create the conditions where we can have a conversation, where we can think, rather than defend our, our position. Okay. And, and, you know, and that's why, again, the, the, the theater sense here is that only bad theater is based upon the notion of leaving. You'd say that <laughs> I have to be here and i think that that's the call now is that we're actually being entrained to start our conversation literally from where we live because that is the center which is everywhere and the circumference which is nowhere mm -hmm. and those like yourself i think certainly we are doing it as well are creating environments they're giving permission to people to say, don't think gold, think linoleum, don't think, ex you know, don't think the cosmic, think ordinary, honor the sense that it's not to get out of the difficulty, it's not to be superior to others, it's to recognize with compassion, my God, look at how they, they didn't get out of anything, but they wrote such, like Beethoven, he didn't get out of his deafness, he didn't get out of his inability to communicate because he couldn't hear and he was angry because he felt that God had abandoned him and he wanted to kill himself. And instead he writes the Ode to Joy. And to me, that's why he's my patron saint. He's what the human spirit is. It's like Job. You take this and this and this and everyone says, no, or you're the strange person or shut up or we don't want to hear it. We don't want you in the room. Well, I find that, that for me, the ones that leave the room and in spite of being shut down, create a relationship that says, you know, between you and me, this still matters. And I think that's the cry in this room. A lot of artists get it. Mm -hmm. We're in a world where artists don't matter mm -hmm. unless they sell and sell big. And then it's not about art anymore. Right. It's about fashion. It's about sales. Right. And, and it's a false promise. Right. And, and, that, you know, and that's why I think that it's up to us to reclaim and to look at and honor now that in the age of Copernicus, people did not think like Copernicus. It took Copernicus and a few others to begin to create the realization that maybe the sun doesn't go around the earth. <laughs> we go around the sun. And that changed everything. And I feel we're in the same point 
of developing the mental martial arts to navigate not the physical matter, the physical waters, but the mental waters. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this has to do with discernment. And that's why I even think with my tarot, my Phoenix Arise, the painting behind me, which creates a DNA and mandalas, these blossoms, I feel are saying that, that it's time for the instrument, that we're all on the same page. It's not that one of us is going to show up and go, children, thou do not knowest. You know, it's like, no, no, we all know. We're all exhausted. We don't need to fill our head with more knowing. We need to fill our hands with a greater agreement to say, well, in spite of it, let me see what happens. And then the hands go, do you feel free? And then the eyes go, do you remember when you read Clouds as a child? And you just allowed even momentarily a sense of wonder to return to the possibility of things. Close that door. Turn off that media. Make it your space. Yeah. Make it where no one can judge you unless you allow them to. Yeah. Reclaim the sacred space, the sacred private space, because this is where the intimacy and vulnerability of your heart will flourish because it won't feel judged. Most of all, it won't feel judged by you because you feel defensive of this vulnerability. Yes. We must create place. Yeah. And understand that the things we feel are not abstract. They're quite literally qualities. And that is we honor, almost like embrace. Part of the thing up here is if you want to know me, hug me. If you want to know me greatly, hug me even closer. That's what Eve tells us. <laughs> and I love that. Hmm. Enough of figuring me out. That's not a good relationship. And you okay, never could. <laughs> well, I'm so glad I've got, gotten to hug you once and I'll be hugging you again. So. Exactly. <laughs> the hugs are coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this quantum hug that we can <laughs> offer to those who are watching us. So wherever you're watching from and whatever time or space, we just send you a hug from these artists' hearts to ours. Thank you so much for Absolutely. being with us where we are and may you all go forth and create your own space where you can be who you are and bring forth what is within you. And maybe from this conversation, you can be inspired to, um, gather your loved ones and dive more deeply into this embrace of home and being together and looking at what matters. Let's get into the linoleum. So <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> well, thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be with you. Please give my love to Carla and we'll look forward to continue dialogue in the, in the sacred libraries of the soul. Wonderful. What a delight. Thank, thank you, Shadow. Thank okay. you. <laughs>